Uh, Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Deuteronomy, 29, verse 1. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, besides the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. And Moses called unto all Israel and said unto them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt, unto Pharaoh, and to all his servants, and unto all his land. The great temptations or testings which thine eyes have seen, the signs and those great miracles, yet the Lord hath not given you a heart to perceive, and eyes to see, and ears to hear unto this day. And I have led you forty years in the wilderness. Your clothes are not waxed old upon you, and thy shoe is not waxed old upon your foot. You have not eaten bread, neither have you drunk wine or strong drink, that you might know that I, the Lord, am the Lord your God. And when you came unto this place, Zion, king of Heshbon, Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, came out against us to battle, and we smote them, and we took their land and gave it for an inheritance to Reubenites and to the Gadites and to the half-tribe of Manasseh. Keep therefore the words of this covenant and do them, that you may prosper in all that you do. You stand this day, all of you, before the Lord your God, your captains of your tribes, your elders and your officers with all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives and the stranger that is in the camp from the hewer of the wood unto the drawer of thy water, that thou shouldst enter into the covenant with the Lord thy God and into his oath, which thy Lord thy God maketh with thee this day, that he may establish thee today for a people unto himself, and that he may be unto thee a God, as he hath said unto thee, as he hath sworn unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Neither with you only do I make this covenant and this oath, but with him that standeth here with us this day before the Lord our God, and also with him that is not here with us this day. For you know how we have dwelt in the land of Egypt and how we came through the nations which you passed by. And you have seen their abominations and their idols, wood and stone and silver and gold, which were among them. Lest there should be any among you, man or woman or family or tribe, whose heart is turned away this day from the Lord our God and to go and serve the gods of these nations. Lest there should be among you any root that beareth gall and wormwood, or bitterness, to be plain. And it came to pass, when he heareth the words of this curse, that he bless himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination of my heart, to add drunkenness to thirst. The Lord will not spare him. But then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smote against that man, and all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him. And the Lord shall blot out his name from under heaven. And the Lord shall separate him unto evil out of all the tribes of Israel, according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in this book of the law. So that the generation to come of your children shall rise up after you, And that the stranger shall come from far off land, shall say, when they see the plagues of that land and the sickness which the Lord hath laid upon it, and that whole land thereof is brimstone and salt and burning that is not sown, nor beareth, nor any grass groweth therein, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and his wrath. Even all nations shall say, Wherefore hath the Lord done thus? Unto the land, what meaneth the heat of his great anger? Then men shall say, because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them forth out of Egypt. For they went and served other gods and worshipped them, gods whom they knew not and whom he had not given unto them. The anger of the Lord was kindled against this land to bring it upon it all the curses that are written in this book. And the Lord rooted them out of their land in anger and in wrath and in great indignation and cast them into another land as it is this day. 
Secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. May God bless his word. Strong words to Israel, aren't they? You know, it's difficult for us to, uh, I think, for us in, in our day, uh, which holds so many creature comforts, conveniences, benefits, things that are good for life. It's hard for us to, to grasp what is going on sometimes around the world. In the world that we live, you know, we can see odd things on the news, but it's difficult to relate with people in North Korea, isn't it? It's difficult to relate to people suffering in Iraq or South Sudan or Somalia or Libya or Iran or any other such place. Because we, we're surrounded with other things, aren't we? With life. How we know it, not as they know it. So it's sometimes difficult for us to comprehend what is going on in the bigger picture and what is yet to come in that bigger picture concerning us and the world in which we live. And I sometimes wonder, you know, do we really understand exactly why we were called, why we were chosen? And what it is God really wants us to do. And what lies ahead. And, and it's vital that we, in, in thinking about all this, that we adhere to the word of God, isn't it? That we stick to this. This, as I said before, is our instruction manual. It's our workshop manual. It's our life manual. All the commands of God. And his son, Jesus Christ, are in this book. Everything pertaining to life can be found here in this book. And so it's, it's vital, it's imperative that we adhere to it. But it's hard. It's still hard, even though we know all this. It's, it's hard to relate to what's going on out there. And it's hard to know, to understand, and even to accept what is going to happen in this world, in this country, in this town, or the town where you live. And you know, at this point in Israel's history, I really don't think they understood either. Just as we don't understand the whole picture. There they were on the banks of the River Jordan, about to enter in to the Promised Land. What lay ahead? For them, all they knew was the Promised Land. And God had given it to them. But they really didn't understand as we can see from history. And it's hard for us to do also. However, we have an advantage today. We have an advantage. God has blessed us with a history. He has blessed us with his word. He has caused all the things that happened to Israel to be recorded for our benefit. So that we could learn from it. So that we wouldn't make the same Mistakes that Israel made. But we still do. I do. We all do. But the word is there for our benefit. That we can learn from it and grow from it. Amen? So let's get into it. Understanding the covenants. God mentioned the covenants, didn't he? Right at the beginning of this chapter chapter 29, and in chapters 27 and 28, God, through Moses, had set out intricate details of this particular covenant, 
This wasn't the covenant that he made with them at Horeb, as we'll see in a moment. This was another covenant in addition to that. But he had set out details of the covenant that they are to keep. What their responsibilities were, in other words, to be part and parcel of this covenant that he was making with them. And in our chapter, in chapter 29, there's an explanation of their 40-year journey through the wilderness. A brief explanation of how God delivered them from Egypt, from the hands of an evil pharaoh. They'd been there for over 400 years, in bondage and trouble. And God had delivered them, and they had had one opportunity to come into the promised land and they'd rejected it through fear and disobedience and so they ended up wandering around the desert for 40 years to come to this point in their journey and there they were at the edge of the promised land everything was going to be great from now on Egypt was behind them God had promised them this land to be theirs. He would defeat their enemies. And he says in verse 1, I said covenants because there are more than one, obviously. Plural, because verse 1 tells us that the words of this covenant are in addition to those that he made with them at Horeb. And that's important to remember. Those that he made at Horeb were the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments. And they're details of a particular covenant. That particular covenant was concerning their life, their heart attitude and their action and interaction with other people, wasn't it? And with God. This is a covenant of the land. This is how they were to act And treat the land. Because the land belongs to God. All the earth belongs to God. God gave it to Israel for them to shepherd, to steward rather. To look after. Borders 27 and 28 tell us, if you read it another time, if they didn't look after it, and if they acted in certain ways, he would remove them from that land, just as he had done the nations that were there before them. Chapter 27 and 28 describe both blessings and cursings for Israel. There are conditions to the blessing. If thou will, I will. I said the land begins, uh, belongs to God. Let's check that out, shall we? Leviticus, chapter 25, verse 23. Start at verse 22. And you shall sow in the eighth year and eat Yet of old fruit until the ninth year, until her fruits come in, you shall eat of the old store. The land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine. For you were strangers and sojourners with me. And in all the land of your possession, you shall grant a redemption for the land. The land belongs to God. And so those that God puts in it have a responsibility to look after it. Would you agree? Don't worry, it gets better. The covenant at Horeb, as I said, was about their basic lives, their heart attitudes as a people belonging to God. A people called out for God. That sounds like us, doesn't it? Are you a people called out by God? Are you a people belonging to God? Of course you are. Yes. 
Praise God for that. And you have in yourself a promised land. Did you know that? This is your promised land. Look after it. But we'll go on. The whole 40-year journey from Egypt, which is symbolic of the world, by the way, the whole 40-year journey from Egypt to the promised land, symbolic of our new life in Christ Jesus, was to teach them that there is only one living God. There's only one living God. And he is to be feared and obeyed. That's what those 40 years were to teach them. They were to break them of the old habits, the old thoughts, the old mindset of being a slave in Egypt to being a people belonging to God. And that isn't, isn't that what God has done for us? Through Jesus, he, he took us out of the world. He taught us by various means that he alone is God. And he has given us new life. He has given us a promised land. But we'll talk more about that a little later. It was to be feared and obeyed. But you know, in obedience is merciful and gracious. And generous. Bountiful in his blessings. For those who would obey and follow him. The next step was the promised land, but this wasn't the end goal. Did you realize that? The promised land for Israel was not the end result. It was part of the process. Our life in Christ in this earth is not the end result. It's part of the process. Let me explain. The land was inhabited. We're talking about Israel now. Okay. The land was inhabited. You had all the ites. You had the Perizzites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, Jebusites. You had all the tribes there that were inhabiting that land. They defiled it through their sin and their wickedness. God was going to cast them out and he was going to bring in New life. Do you know that sounds an awful lot like us? This body, this soul, this mind are inhabited with old ways, old thoughts, old lusts, old desires. You name it, they're there. And God has placed in us new life. But that new life has to conquer All that old stuff. It's part of the process, but it's not the end result. Do you know something? Israel wasn't unified as a nation until King David. Quite a few years after they went into the promised land. That was when God blessed them as a nation. One nation under God. Sounds familiar, that. One nation under God. I've heard that somewhere else. But that's it. And this, our process, is inhabiting this new life. It's conquering this new life through Christ Jesus. What did John the Baptist say? I must decrease as he must increase. That is the process. And that process will only be finished and accomplished when we all come under one king, Christ Jesus. And that will happen when we meet him in the air, when we are renewed to be as he is. Isn't that true? So from now till then, we are still in the process of conquering our land. Do you agree? Praise the Lord. The land was inhabited and had to be conquered. 
but he wasn't until King David, much, much later, that it came a one nation at peace and at rest. And it's not until we meet with Christ that we also will be complete. One in him. So we're in this process as they were about to embark. And this is where I see us in 2015. We're in this promised life, this new life in Christ. We're still though at the stage where our land, our body, our mind and our spirit still have the odd tribe. They still have the odd defilement. They still have the odd thing that needs conquering under the foot of Christ Jesus. They still need to be brought under the law of God and cleansed and purified. And this is where we can become confused in our thinking, I believe. Yes, we are saved. We're saved. Praise God for that. We're saved from Egypt. We're saved from the world, aren't we? God has taken us out of the world. And praise God for that. Praise God that our lives are not as they were. Praise God that we're no longer bound for an eternal damnation in hell. Eternal separation from God with no hope of change. But there is an ongoing battle. There is an ongoing war with the enemy that still resides. And that battle is for control of this. Not my finger. What it's pointing at. The mind. That is our biggest battleground. The mind. Because if the enemy can somehow control that, deviate it from the mind of Christ, he's winning. And we are losing. The battle is for control of the mind, our priorities, our heart attitudes, our motivations, the things that drive us to do things. That's where the battle is for us. And this battle will only be done when we're perfected in Christ Jesus. Just as Israel's battle in the promised land was only completed when he was unified under King David and then Solomon, obviously, when the the temple was built. But do you get the picture? This word is here for a reason. It's here to teach us, to educate us, to show us as we'll see later, that what happened physically to Israel will and does happen to us spiritually in our day. We look forward to the Harpezo, the meeting together with him in the air, when we're changed in the twinkling of an eye. Are you looking forward to that? So am I. Praise God. Maranatha, Lord Jesus, come soon. But at this present time, we're in a spiritual battle. As indeed Israel, or the tribes at that point, were about to be, as they crossed in to that new life. And now we come to the covenant requirements. Somebody's not happy. In chapters 27 and 28... God wanted the people to understand that the old way of life, all the things that we've just talked about, old motivations, old mindset, old lusts, old desires, old dreams, are now ended. They are no more. All that way of life is now finished. We're out of Egypt We are now a new being. We are new now new creations in Christ Jesus. Is that right? Embarked on a whole new way of life. In accordance and in obedience to God's word. 
And our minds are to be conformed to the likeness of Christ Jesus, as we saw and heard last week from Ben as he, uh, as he spoke and, and prayed about the communion. We're not to be conformed to this world, are we? Because God's taken us out of this world. We're to now be conformed to the likeness of Christ Jesus. All these things, if you like, have to be reversed. Just as the, the promised land, the things in the promised land had to be reversed. These nations, these heathen nations who had inhabited this land belonging to God, had defiled it through their wickedness and their sin. And God was going to cleanse his land of them. And bring in a people that will be his people, a pure, a righteous people to inhabit his land so that that land would be an example to every nation on the face of the earth. That there is one true living God. The priority from now on in this new life, in this promised land, if you like, will be obedience to God. Not self-motivation, not self-gratification, not self-aggrandizement. Everything now would be God or Jesus-centered, not man-centered. That's a totally different change, isn't it? See, the promised land under the heathen nations, everything was me, 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 me. I, mine, my will, my thoughts, my land. But in the new, in the promised land, everything was a gift of God. Resulting from obedience to his word. Verses 10 to 29 really explain all this well. But just so that we today don't think or have the the mindset or the idea, well, that was then. That was then. Come on, John, that was thousands of years ago. It's a different world now. Doesn't relate. Doesn't compute, as they say. God informs us rather in verse 14 and 15 that this is for all generations. Let's read it again. Neither with you only do I make this covenant and this oath, but with him that standeth here with us today before the Lord our God and also with him that is not here with us today. That doesn't mean that they'd left some behind in Egypt. And they were going to catch up in a few months. It's for all generations. All generations. And why is it all generations? Because as Paul stated, as we'll see later, first the physical, then comes the spiritual. What happens to them in the physical concerns us in the spiritual. Our enemies are not flesh and blood. Are they? No. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers, rulers of this dark world, the dark spirits behind what the physical are doing. That's where the battle is. And that's why we are called to pray. But to go on. And this is for all generations until the plan is completed. For Israel, it was until they were unified, wasn't it? For us, it's up until we are unified in Christ, in the air. Hallelujah. But I have a feeling this plan's not yet complete. I don't know about you. I don't think it's complete yet, is it? No. So that means... We're still in the process. The Apostle Paul relates for us in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 46. If you want to turn to it, I've already uh, mentioned it once. First, the physical, then that which is spiritual. Paul understood. 
Paul understood that God has left us this word. All this word is beneficial to us for teaching, for correction, for rebuke, for encouragement. Isn't it? Yeah, that's what he means. But all the Old Testament happened in the physical, didn't it? All the things that happened to Israel happened in the physical. And to us today, through Jesus Christ, our new enemies are spiritual. As we've heard from the Apostle Paul. Meaning that what happened in Israel in the physical has meaning for us today in the spiritual. Excuse me for repeating myself. But we need to understand this. Don't we? We need to understand that our battle is not with men and women. No matter what their religion. Our battle is in the spirit realm. With the spirit behind those people. Those people are deceived. Who bring evil and wickedness into this world. The devil owns them. They're his. Our battle is not with them. It's who deceived them. That's where we need to be clear in our mind, in our thinking. Because we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers. But the battle is no less severe. The battle is no less important. And the battle is no less vicious. Because even though it be a spiritual battle, it still destroys lives. Amen. If we look closely at verse 14 to verse 20 in in our text in Deuteronomy 29, we'll see that Israel had to pass through and by several heathen nations on their way to the promised land. And this was to show them the difference between the way, God's way, and the ways of the world. They saw the false idols. They saw the wickedness. They saw the perversion. And all these things in small skirmishes. And through those small skirmishes, God toughened them up for the main battle ahead. And so he does with us. We haven't seen trouble yet. Praise God. Others in this world have. He may come here, he may not. God may take you before that happens. Personally, individually. But he will come. Because this word tells us it will come. It's a definite, it's an absolute. And so we need to be prepared. Not just physically, but our mind needs to be prepared too. To see and accept what is really happening and what is going to happen. They went through and passed by these heathen nations to show them the difference between the pure and the defiled. Let's put it that way. And also to toughen them up for battle and learn to trust God. That God would bring them through in the bigger battles to come. And there were bigger battles to come. They would also, through these experiences, see the justice of what Moses read to them in chapter 27 and 28. Because they would see what kind of thing was being, was happening rather, in the land they were about to enter. How the land would be defiled, how it was defiled utterly. Can you see that? God was giving them a taster of the battle to come. Because it was for these same sins that these nations were being removed from the land. And God was warning them 
What did he say in chapter 27 and 28? Read it for yourselves. The blessings and the cursings. They were being brought into a land to look after it, to be obedient to God in it, to purify it as a land belonging to God. And here there were these wicked nations who defiled it. This, what they were seeing here, justified what God had said to them. Because he was saying, in effect, if you do these things that these people are doing, you will suffer the same consequences. And indeed, in this history book, amongst other things, it tells us that they didn't obey and they were removed from the land. The God is merciful. He will give them another chance. We know that because we are grafted into them. We haven't overtaken them. We haven't taken their place. We are grafted in to the true olive tree, which is Israel. Praise God. He's not finished with them yet, but there are consequences in this life. There are responsibilities and consequences for not doing it God's way. This is what I'm saying. And I believe this is what God was teaching Israel through 27 and here in 29 in Deuteronomy. In verse 22 to 29, God speaks of a burning as that of Sodom and Gomorrah for sins. He relates what's going on in the promised land at this time and maybe for a future time, we could probably look at that as what's happening there now as being rewarded with a time of burning such as Sodom and Gomorrah encountered. We know that God won't destroy the earth again by water, don't we? He has promised that. He's given us his rainbow as a guarantee of that promise. But he has reserved this world to fire. To fire. Everything in this world will be consumed. Because it's defiled. We know that God will purge the world with fire. And that time, brothers and sisters, is drawing near. It really is drawing near. We can hide our heads in the sand. But it will come just the same. So for us today, the old life is gone. The former priorities are gone. As with Israel, there is now only one overriding priority and that is obedience to God. Obedience is better than sacrifice. One overriding priority for us is obedience to him. That's obedience to the call and the life of Jesus Christ. Everything else must be secondary. Everything else must be secondary. If he alone is God, then he alone takes first place in this life. And this is the stark reality of why scripture says, many are called, but few are chosen. That's the reality of this life. Many are called, but few are chosen. Why? Because few will obey. Few will give their all to God. To receive all of Christ. That's the truth. That's why we call the remnant. That's the stark reality. It's not easy to put everything under one priority, is it? It's not easy to put things that we love and we cherish under another priority which overrides it. But that is the situation in this life that we live. And such it was with Israel as they entered the promised land. Obedience as they found out in Ai is vital because disobedience 
doing your own thing doesn't work. It brings pain and it brings heartache. The people that God sent in to conquer the promised land had families. They had responsibilities. They had dreams. They had visions of what they wanted to do. All that had to come second to the call that God had placed on them. And that was to conquer the promised land. Make it pure. Bring it under the law of God. Bring it under his control. They all had dreams and visions, aspirations. However, all that had to be put on the back burner to complete the task ahead. And so it is with us today, brothers and sisters. It's not easy to stand here and say this because it concerns me too. I have things I'd love to do. I have dreams. I have things that I would love to have, love to do. All that has to come second to God. Because only in obeying, in, only in obeying that will there be blessing and growth. And so it is for us all. As I said before, the first is the physical, then the spiritual. And that we see is true. But there will come a day where we'll see that reversed. We've seen the physical in here. We've read about it this morning. That's the physical. What happened to Israel? We are now living in the spiritual battle, aren't we? But there'll come a day where we will return with Christ Jesus. And we will judge and rule with him in the physical. But the preparation is in the spiritual. That's the fulfillment. This is the process. However, to come to the the point, the conclusion, if you like, if we see that our life is not as it should be, prayers not answered, dreams not fulfilled, visions darkened or or whatever, things just not happening the way we would really like them, it may not always be an attack of the enemy. It may just be that we are not obeying the call of Christ. Sometimes our troubles can be self-inflicted. I know some of mine are. Sometimes we need to look at how we are holding to the requirements of our promised land. We have responsibilities for this promised land. And how are we responding to those responsibilities? To a large extent, that will govern how our life runs. Because this promised land is our new life in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're in a process, brothers and sisters. Weary ye not in well-doing. Be encouraged. Obedience is better than sacrifice. But with obedience comes blessing. God wants to bless you. God wants to bless his people. There will be blessing in abundance when we meet with him on that day. But until then... We have a land to conquer. And the governing factor in that land is the mind. Be ye renewed with the mind of Christ. God bless you.